Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, who is our first invited speaker. John Abaud is the US Census Bureau's Associate Director for Research and Methodology and Chief Scientist. He has been in the position since June 2016. The Research Methodology Directorate leads critical work to modernize uh, operations and products, and uh, he has been doing some very interesting work in leading the agency's effort to create a differentially private protection system for the 2020 Census. And that is what he's going to tell us about today. With this, I'll hand it over to John. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Kamalika and Russ for the invitation. I can't help but call out that I don't think that this many economists have ever been in the same room to listen to me talk. So it's really a pleasure uh, to be here um, and uh, present today a little talk on uh, how the Census Bureau is trying to um, be a good data steward in the 21st century. I need to remind you that uh, I'm appearing in my official capacity, but my remarks represent my own opinion and not those of the US Census Bureau. OK, I thought I would start off by um, showing the acknowledgment slide I usually present when I talk about the work that the Census Bureau has been doing to protect the confidentiality of the responses that we get from the 2020 Census of Population and Housing. That's its full title. I'll just say 2020 census from now on. Uh, you will probably recognize some, but a distinct minority of the names on this list. Uh, I want to call out a few. Uh, first, I want to call out Dan Kiefer uh, at Penn State, but who was, uh, took his sabbatical year from 2016-17 uh, at the Census Bureau. And he took the scientific lead in designing the system that I'm going to talk to you about today. And Simpson Garfinkel, the senior scientist for confidentiality and data access, um, who came over to the Census Bureau from NIST, where he was one of their uh, uh, cryptography and data security experts. He took the responsibility for most of the engineering decisions that have, uh, have been made. I won't read out the rest of the names. I will call out, in particular, though, Tammy Adams, who is a mathematical statistician. She designed the field operational control system for the 2020 census, where she became an expert in using Garobi. She was on the team that uh, produced many of the data products for the 2010 census. And so she was the metadata database that I needed to get the reconstruction uh, tax and analyses that I'm going to talk about today uh, going. All right, so let's get started. Conducting a census of population is an extremely challenging job. It has two goals. We usually call them the dual mandate. The first goal is to collect the data that are necessary to underpin the democracy. I think many of you who are uh, Americans, and possibly many of you who are not, know that the taking of a census of population is in Article 1, Section 1, sorry, Article 1, Section 2 of the US Constitution. Um, I often wear a tie with that article on it, but I know that there's probably not a tie within five miles of here, so I didn't, uh, I didn't do that today. That, that says to conduct a population census within three years of the adoption of the Constitution and every 10 years thereafter, and then to use the results of that census to apportion the House of Representatives, to divide up the political power in the United States. So that's the mandate to produce data that are fit for use the statute that enables that mandate, Title 13 of the US Code, Section 9, requires that we protect the privacy of the individual data. That's a statutory obligation, but it's also necessary to ensure the trust 
of the residents of the United States who respond to the census and to prevent abuse by others of the data that we collect. To give you some idea of just how big a job conducting a census of population is, the 2020 census has a life cycle cost estimate of $15.6 billion. Um, for some tech companies, that's not necessarily a large number, but that is the largest peacetime undertaking of a, sing in a single activity of the U.S. government, so it is actually a large number by governmental standards. It has to uh, conduct what we call an address-based enumeration of the resident population with a reference date of April 1st, 2020. Uh, it's address-based because the critical factor is geolocating the respondents to the census to a physical location so they can be put, first of all, in the correct state for apportionment, and then in the correct voting district when all of the legislative districts in the United States are redrawn using the first data product that's released from the 2020 census. The field operations, many other operations have already begun, but the field operations begin in earnest this summer when we do the address canvassing. In 2010 and in previous censuses, that address canvassing operation involved sending an enumerator to every physical address in the United States known to the Census Bureau as of the summer before the census and getting it confirmed. We did most of that work in office over the last decade, and so these field enumerators will go to substantially less than 100% um, of the addresses, something on the order of 30% of the addresses, but they'll start working this summer, and we're already in the process of onboarding them. What are known as the peak operations, the activity of the census that you will see, uh, begin with the self-response period, which the invitation letter goes out in March. The self-response date is targeted to April 1st of 2020. And then what's called the non-response follow-up, which typically begins about six weeks after Census Day and continues until the director of the Census Bureau, uh, in consultation with uh, many, many uh, operational people, decides to end it, usually sometime near the end of August. All right. The peak data processing begins when the, uh, when the Internet self-response instrument is turned on. And the uh, peak data analysis begins when the field operations close in September. So these are, these are the basic steps. I should point out that I didn't put it on the slide, but the advertising campaign, the integrated communication campaign, uh, has already begun, and the partnership program has already begun. So you'll begin seeing uh, advertising and other, uh, and other content related to the 2020 census very soon. And here are the major data products. I've already mentioned the first one. By the 31st of December in 2020, we have to release to the Secretary of Commerce, who then delivers to the President of the United States, the apportionment of the House of Representatives. If you don't know the apportionment rules, they are conducted in the following manner. Every state gets at least one, and then the remainder are apportioned based on an algorithm known as the Hill-Huntington algorithm, which essentially minimizes the proportional uh, deviations of the uh, congressional districts. Shortly thereafter, and by statute before April 1st of 2021, we release a data product uh, known by the very informative name of PL94-171 and uh, referred to by the more informative name of the redistricting data which is a very detailed file that is used by every state in the United States and the D Department of Justice to draw all the electoral legislative districts in the country, not just the congressional ones. Any legislative body in the district has its um, districts redrawn on the basis of these data. And then in short order, we deliver a summary of the demographic and housing characteristics, a very detailed one, usually around the summer of the year after the census, and then detailed race and ethnicity data. We ask for the form, and I'll show you in a bit, uh, 
and then uh, detailed data on tribal affiliations for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. In the 2010 census, this was more than 150 billion statistical tabulations. But the total data file was 15 gigabytes, and that includes um, fields that are never intended for publication. That was a lot of publications from what I think most of you would recognize as a relatively small amount of data by modern standards. So just to give you some idea, we intend to collect from each household essentially to confirm the address they were found at in our address database or collect the address of residents. And the definition of where you should respond is where you usually sleep or would have usually slept on April 1st, 2020. There's six pages of administrative regulations that define that, but I didn't bother to put those up here. We're going to get the total number of people living at that address, whether the housing unit is owned or rented, and then for each person living at that address, the person's name, the relationship to the adult person who's filling out the census form, we usually call that the householder or now person one, birth date and age, sex at birth, Hispanic ethnicity, defined according to the 1997 OMB regulations, but now allowing a write-in for specific origins, and race, defined according to the same 1997 Office of Management and Budget categories, but allowing for each category detailed write-ins with more specifics. And finally, citizenship, although that question is currently enjoined pending Supreme Court review. We estimate there'll be 140 million addresses, 126 million occupied housing units, and 330 million pe people covered by the 2020 census. So I did a uh, back of the envelope con calculation, and that's roughly 100 gigabytes of data. Very generous. That's actually four times my estimate, so I, I upped it quite a bit. Just to put that in context, because this is a truly big data conference, that's less than 1% of the worldwide mobile data use per second, according to the latest Cisco estimates. So basically, we're going to spend $15.6 billion and collect a quantity of data that most of your companies would miss if they blinked while they were scooping in the data that comes into the large tech company inputs. So it might seem like the Census Bureau's data stewardship pr problem is very different from the one at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Netflix, dot, dot, dot. But those appearances can be deceiving. We all face the same fundamental law of information recovery, although I tend to refer to this as the database reconstruction theorem or the database reconstruction vulnerability. And we can all learn the same lessons from the cryptographers who took on the problem of how to publish statistics safely from confidential databases. You can't publish too many statistics. Noise infusion is necessary, not optional, necessary to meet most reasonable definitions of privacy protection. And transparency about the methods is a benefit. Being able to say exactly what you did to protect the confidentiality of the data is a, business, is a benefit. It allows the users of the data to understand how they should treat the statistics that you release, and it allows the providers of the data to independently verify that the confidentiality protection algorithms worked. One of the, uh, if you look at our code base, which I'll show you where to find at the end of this talk, one of the things that goes in, there's a fairly obscure looking calculation that you wouldn't have any idea why it was stuck in the code. It's stuck in the code because with a very, 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 very high probability, if it's not equal to zero, the algorithms were actually run. Okay. When I started in this job in June of 2016, I began a project to discover whether or not the way that the Census Bureau had traditionally protected the confidentiality of its publications was vulnerable to a database reconstruction attack and then to a reconstruction abetted re-identification attack. 
So what we did gradually over the course of about 18 months was using only the published data from the 2010 census, we reconstructed records for all 308,745,538 people that were enumerated in the 2010 census. That's the official population from April 1st of 2010. We then took those reconstructed records and we used non-probabilistic record linkage. We joined them to commercial databases that we had acquired around the 2010 census to add personally identifiable information, names and addresses, to the reconstructed census records. If we were able to do that successfully, we called that a putative re-identification. That means that someone else attempting this would claim that this record is associated with this person. We then compared the putative re-identifications to the official gold standard confidential data inside the census firewall. When we could successfully link the putative re-identifications to the confidential data, we called that a confirmed re-identification. Uh, the data linkage experts in the audience might call that fourth bullet recall and that fifth bullet um, sensitivity. We called it a confirmed re-identification because it means that we were able to establish that that claim was correct. The harm from this attack is that the attacker would learn the actual self-response on race and ethnicity, which was not contained in any of those commercial databases. So it had features to the commercial databases that were not otherwise obtainable. Here's what we found. First of all, because of the publication standards that were used on the 2010 census, you can always reconstruct the census block, which is the 15-digit identifier that identifies which of the 11 million blocks in the United States that person lived at, and whether the person was of voting age exactly. So the records are right, and they're right in all 6,207,027 blocks in the 2010 census that contained any people at all. Next, we took the block, the sex, the age and years, all 63 OMB race categories and ethnicity, reconstructed them, and compared the 308 million plus records to the gold standard confidential data on just those tabulation variables. No PII yet. They matched exactly, bit for bit, on 46% of the population. That's 142 million of the 308 million plus. Allowing the age to vary by plus or minus one year, they matched for 71% of the population or for 219 million. That doesn't say anything about whether I could say what person that is. What it says is that those reconstructed data were a highly reliable image of the tabulation variables in the confidential data. That's salient because in the confidential data on those variables, more than half of the population is unique, meaning there's no other record in the database that has the same values for those five variables. We used only the block, sex, and age to link to the commercial data. There we got a putative re-identification rate of 45% of the population, meaning we were able to attach a name and address to 138 million of the 308 million plus records. We then compared all the fields, name, block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity, directly to the confidential data. It's a confirmed re-identification if all of those fields match except for age, which was allowed to vary by plus or minus one. We successfully uh, confirmed the re-identification of 38% of the putatives, or 52 million people. That's 17% of the population. For the confirmed re-identifications, race and ethnicity are learned correctly although the attacker will still have some uncertainty because the attacker doesn't have the census confidential data to confirm the re-identification with. This research establishes that the vulnerability identified by Yurit Diner and Kobe Nassim in their famous uh, 2003 article on database reconstruction is not a risk, it's an issue. That a risk is defined 
as something that has a probability less than one, and an issue is defined as something that has a probability one. The publication methods are vulnerable to reconstruction attacks. Now that might seem like a pretty specific example, but I'm pretty sure that just about everybody in this room knows a few things. They know that if you start harvesting data and you don't know whether they apply to the same entity, that you can reliably use record linkage techniques or more generally entity resolution techniques to say that collections of features that aren't on the same record all belong to the same entity. Entity resolution is a big business, and there are probably more experts in this room on it than, uh, than there are in most of the statistical agencies around the world combined. You also know that machine learning classifiers, AI, take these amplified entity records and build extremely reliable classifiers, recommenders, demand management systems, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows that all of that is much harder with provable privacy guarantees for the entities. So that's where I think we have a lot of common ground. We're trying to engineer a solution to a vulnerability that if you publish too many statistics too accurately, no one in the input database can be given any reasonable assurance of the confidentiality of their input data. The same solutions don't apply to publications like the census publications or uh, AI engines, but the same principles do, and the engineering challenges, I think, can be shared across statistical agencies and the tech industry. So the Census Bureau's 150 billion tabulations from 15 gigabytes of data and tech industries, data integration, and deep learning AI systems are both subject to an economic problem, the fundamental economic problem that is inherent in privacy protection, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on today. You didn't think you were going to get out of here without a little economics, did you? All right. I don't think I'm alone in noting that one of the hardest lessons in modern data science is to accept that the fundamental law of information recovery imposes a resource constraint on data publication. That resource constraint is the death knell for traditional methods of, of publication from confidential data and not just for statistical agencies. This is inherently an economic problem because there is a finite amount of information in any confidential database. And you can spend it two ways. You can create statistics, a classifier, a recommendation system, a demand management system. Those are all statistics because they expose characteristics of the database to the user, just like how many people of uh, non-Hispanic white origin live in this block is, is a statistic. It exposes characteristics of the database to the users. You can either do that or you can provide provable confidentiality protections, provable privacy protections to the entities that contribute to those data. And you can't do all of one and have any of the other. And I like to represent this on something that economists call a production possibilities frontier. Uh, if you're a statistician, you might also recognize it as a receiver operating characteristics curve. On the horizontal axis, you plot the privacy loss. We're going to be talking about differentially private systems here. And so the privacy loss is that privacy loss parameter epsilon that governs the global disclosure risk associated with a data set that's being protected by differential privacy. The vertical axis is a particular form of the accuracy measure. Accuracy is in the eyes of the beholder. And so there's no one accuracy measure for any particular um, data product. There can be many. I'm going to illustrate the accuracy measures that we're using to calibrate the redistricting application, but they all have the same feature. It's being measured as 100% accurate 
when the answer is identical to the answer you would get if there were no confidentiality protections, no privacy protections at all in the data publication system. So if you just tabulated the raw data or you just built the recommender system from inputs that haven't been protected by any kind of privacy filters, then 100% accuracy is the answer you get when you use those inputs. So it's a proper asymptote here. You can never be more than 100% accurate in that sense. You can never do better than an unfettered access to the data would allow. The zero, zero point is no accuracy. As the cryptographers have shown us, if you apply proper cryptographic definitions, if you insist on full semantic security, then the statistics are themselves a full encryption of the database, and they can't possibly have any accuracy. So those two points, labeled no accuracy and no privacy, uh, I've deliberately not given you a scale on the uh, horizontal axis because it depends on uh, how you set your engineering up. But those two things are the extreme. In the middle, that thing is the production possibilities frontier. That's the best accuracy that you can achieve with the indicated privacy loss. And that's a global accuracy measure, or sorry, a global privacy loss measure. That's the epsilon from differential privacy takes account of all publications that are summarized in the accuracy measure. First lesson from economics, it's inefficient to operate below the frontier. If you operate below the frontier, you're giving up something that you can get for free. You're either using more privacy protection than you need for the given amount of accuracy, or you're surrendering accuracy because you poorly implemented your privacy protection system. That's lesson one. In economics, that's called X inefficiency. But the other lesson, and the one that's the hardest to internalize, is it's infeasible to operate above the frontier. You would like to get to the zero 100% point. I won't even try. Yes, here. You'd like to get to the zero 100% point, but that's infeasible. All right. In economic terms, your preferences say that you're better going in the northwest direction, but the preferences are constrained by that production possibility frontier as to how close they can get to the zero 100% point. The third lesson from economics, and one that's most familiar, I suspect, to the people in this audience, is that research can move that frontier out. Better designed algorithms can deliver more accuracy for a given privacy loss. So the production possibility frontier, the blue line in the graphs I've just been showing you, is not a constant. It's a constantly improving uh, way to publish data with provable privacy protections. In economics, that's called technological change, and technological change is happening in this industry at a prodigiously rapid rate. So those are the fundamentals. This is a hard problem because the publishers of data, so in my building, that's the statisticians and demographers who prepared those 150 billion tabulations from the 2010 census. In your buildings, that's the designers of those classifiers, recommender systems, demand management systems. They're used to thinking that they can have all the accuracy they want, just get more data, and that's never true. 100% accuracy is associated with no privacy protections. Right. But when they ask you, the computer science tech wizards, well, which point on this privacy loss accuracy frontier should I aim for? There's a really, really good reason why either you should say, I can't tell you, or they should say, I don't believe you when you answer. It's because it is fundamentally a social choice which of these two points, this one with high privacy protection and low accuracy, or this one with low privacy protection and high accuracy, which of those two points is better? No algorithm in the entire 40,000 plus papers published on differential privacy to date, no algorithm has an answer to that question. Algorithms labeled optimal are what economists call ex-efficient. That means they give you 
a point on the production possibility frontier for a given epsilon. They're not optimal in the economic sense because optimality in the economic sense means that you've traded off the social benefits from better accuracy against the social costs of worse privacy protection. And there's nothing in the computer science to help with that problem. That requires a social welfare function. It requires a description of the preferences of the population that enabled the statistics. So in this case, description of the preferences of the population of the United States about their trade-offs for privacy versus accuracy. And I don't think it's any secret that that population is monumentally heterogeneous in their preferences. But that dual mandate I showed you on the first slide, that dual mandate says that somebody has to choose. And at the moment, that somebody is the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee of the U.S. Census Bureau, because that's who the statute enabled. So how did that work? Well, we confronted this economic problem. We implemented a formal privacy guarantee for the 2020 Census that relies on a core of differentially private subroutines. And they assigned the technology tuning, building that frontier, to the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance Team, specifically told not to engineer any hard choices into the algorithms. They're all controlled by knobs. And then the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, that's essentially all the associate directors of the Census Bureau and the deputy director, set the parameters. So how does that work? Well, to be fit for their intended uses, we have to subject the entire publication system to a privacy loss budget. So every person inside the Census Bureau's headquarters and all of its user communities in the redistricting area, in the demographic area, around the country, all of their uses have to be identified and codified and summarized in some formal fitness for use accuracy statistics to design the prototype system that was used for the 2018 end-to-end -end census test, we did this for redistricting applications. We now have to face many of the person and household level tables in the demographic and housing characteristics, and we've done that too. But there are still 100 billion queries that we have to figure out how to summarize in a reasonable way, including suppression, but that's probably not the, the answer that most people are expecting. It'll be a question of how accurate those, those queries are or can be. We've developed methods for quantifying and displaying the system-wide trade-offs between the accuracy of the decennial census data products and the privacy loss budget assigned to the complete set of tabulations. Considering that that work began in mid-2016, that no organization anywhere in the world has developed a full central differential privacy system and deployed it, it's already a monumental achievement. I'm going to show you some actual data computed off the 2010 census used in determining how to set the privacy loss budget for the 2018 end-to-end -end census. So these are not hypothetical figures anymore. These are real figures. The x-axis is the actual privacy loss parameter epsilon for the entire system, all the tables summarized in this figure. So what are the tables summarized in this figure? The blue line is the block level redistricting tabulations. So for every block in the state of Rhode Island, it's the voting age population and the non-voting age population broken down by 126 different race and ethnicity categories as specified by the 1997 Office of Management and Budget Guidelines a table for every block. Those tables aggregate to the orange line, that might be red in some of your eyes, which is the next one up, which is the tract level summary. So the typical block has about 30 people in it if it's inhabited. The typical tract has about 4,000 people in it if it's inhabited. The next two lines, the green and the yellow line, are coincident because the data are similarly accurate at both the county, there are only five counties in Rhode Island, and the state level, there's only one state in Rhode Island. 
So these represent the actual efficiency of the algorithms used to do the 2018 test products as they would be fit from the 2010 data. So this is the result of simulations that use those data as input. The debate occurred on November 8th of 2018 inside the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee. I was in New York City doing other duties as assigned, so I uh, came in by video. The Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee for the end-to-end -end test chose the block level epsilon, chose the block level point where epsilon is 0.25 and accuracy is 0.64, which means that the uh, Blocks, which are the pixels used to build the legislative districts, have those properties. There is no legislative district in the country that is a single block. Those blocks are used to build geographic areas with increasingly larger populations as the size of the population represented in the particular legislature increases. And so what's salient is that even at that same epsilon, remember this epsilon isn't separately applied to each of the geographic levels. The epsilon is shared across all the geographic levels. It's a global privacy loss budget allocated according to the top-down algorithms, I'll show you the reference for that too, that were designed into the 2020 disclosure avoidance system. Well, for a tract, which remember has about 4,000 people in it on average, the accuracy is 98%. And for counties, and the state, the accuracy is essentially 100%. The system has the property that as the population in the geographic area being summarized increases, the accuracy increases. This accuracy metric is one that was selected for the redistricting application. It's basically one minus the average total variation distance in all of the tables produced at that geographic level. That said, the 2018 end-to-end -end census test products are test products. They're not going to be used to draw any legislative districts anywhere in the state of Rhode Island or anyplace else. Consequently, the DCEP thought that it would be best to err on the side of heightened privacy protection rather than heightened accuracy in this test because first of all, it might turn out that epsilon of 0.25 is perfectly adequate for the redistricting application. It might well be. But secondly, nobody's going to do any redistricting with these data. They're just going to load them into their computer programs and make sure they're formatted correctly. So there was no good case for increasing the accuracy. That's not the case for the subsequent decisions. There's an excellent case for increasing the accuracy. And this chart, this chart is just the tip of the iceberg. In the demographic profiles, the sex and age data of each block and tract need to be summarized, and they need to be summarized by race and ethnicity. In the detailed race and ethnicity tables, the someplace between four and 800 detail codes, they don't exist yet because the people haven't written in their answers yet, but that's the range of values we expect, have to be summarized in a way that allows representatives of those different interest groups to identify how many of them they are and what some of their demographic properties are. For the American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tribal areas, the census is their only access to data on the counts of those populations until the next census because the American Community Survey has inadequate sample size to tabulate most of them. So it's important to understand that redistricting demography, race, ethnicity, and the one I haven't mentioned, those all have use cases where the defenders of those use cases make a pretty coherent argument for high accuracy. But living out here might not be a realistic option because living out there, the relative promises that differential privacy guarantees do not translate into nearly as strong a confidentiality protection as when you live over here. That's a really, really hard social choice problem 
and we need to work hard and use more psychological, sociological, demographic, and economic tools, as well as some computer science to try to solve it. I think internet giants are struggling to deal with the same choice. I think their privacy engineers tell them that they can get reasonable accuracy. In fact, I saw a presentation last week that suggested Epsilon's in the same range we're considering if the Census Bureau can deliver decent AI. But I'm guessing, you can confirm during the Q&A period, I'm just about done, I'm guessing that when you sit around the conference tables in your companies, the privacy engineers have on one side of the table the arguments for how to get decent privacy protection, and the accuracy engineers have on their side of the table all of the cost-benefit analysis associated with removing 1% of uncertainty in a classifier. It's not an any easier choice for your companies than it is for my employer. But just because it's not an easy choice doesn't mean it will go away. You can make some of these choices implicitly. And if you do, this picture is almost surely going to come back to comment on your choices. So science and policy have to address a lot of questions. For the 2020 Census, we need a policy that says what the privacy loss budget should be for all of the uses of the 2020 Census. We need to discuss how the Census Bureau should handle management-imposed accuracy requirements. For example, we are releasing the populations of the 50 states without privacy protections. If you do your math, that is a violation of differential privacy. It's one mandated by the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, and we will be commenting on the implications for the privacy guarantees in the presence of those management-imposed accuracy requirements. Then we have to decide how to allocate that privacy loss budget over the next seven decades, 72 years from the census it's officially released to the public, which is why you can use the 1940 census right now, and I'll show you how you might want to do that in a second. Can the Census Bureau insist that researchers present their differentially private analysis programs as a part of the project review process? If we did, we had no, at the moment, we would have no projects to review because most of the analysts don't know how to do that. But even if we did, where would the experts to assess those proposals and certify the implementations come from? That's not a skill set that has yet been developed inside statistical agencies. And I might be speaking out of school here, but I suspect that statistical agencies amongst the representatives in this room are not the only businesses that don't have that skill set handy. So if you want more background on the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System, the design is discussed in front of the committee, the Census Scientific Advisory Committee in, in the 2017 presentation. Last year, my KDD talk talked about the difference between the top-down and the block-by-block -block algorithms. We have a 2018 WPES paper that talks about the implementation issues, a recent ACMQ paper that talks about database reconstruction in general. The 2018 CSAC presentation shows how they were implemented for the 2018 end-to-end -end test. And we released a blog last Thursday that shows you how to access the public code base. We put the code base in the public domain that we used for the 18 test. And then how to load the 1940 census curated by IPMS into that code base and do your own experiments with our software. I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Hi. Heroes first. Go ahead. Say your name and affiliation, please. Hi, my name's Brian Milch. I work at Google. Um, I'm wondering how you've worked on translating these epsilons, which are these abstract numbers in the differential privacy theory, into something like how much somebody can figure out your race, or some kinds of questions you can really get your hands on in thinking about potential harms. OK, so thank you for that question. 
The first thing I'd like to refer you to is my 2019 American Economic Review article with Ian Schmutty. It appeared in the January edition. It's also on archive. It's the same version on archive, so if you don't remember and you can't get past the paywall, you can see it there, where we showed how to interpret the epsilon and then how to translate it into something that you could put in a social welfare function to make decisions about. And then a very recent paper in the American Economic Association Papers and Proceedings, it should not be firewalled, uh, Ian Schmutty, Lars Vilhuber, William Sexton, and I showed how to translate the differential privacy epsilon into the kind of re-identification guarantee that uh, the people I work with can interpret. So as I think most people know, uh, formal privacy systems give you a relative guarantee. They don't make many assumptions about the, arbit the uh, attacker's priors. What they do is they produce guarantees on how much those priors are improved as a consequence of the statistical publications. So we showed that the system, similar to the one used in the 18 test, could be interpreted as not improving the prior of re-identifying a specific attribute and associating with a specific person by more than e to the 2 epsilon. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, Tom Dieter from Amazon. Um, so thank you very much. Really fascinating talk. Um, I was interested in the record linkage attacks that you mentioned and whether you've looked at uh, what happens as you increase your epsilon on the performance of those record linkage attacks and whether, and whether you've considered using that as an extra tool to help you when choosing an epsilon. Well, thanks very much for that question. So, so we're continuing to do experiments with those reconstruction and re-identification attacks. And as we speak, the code base is running on uh, what for the Census Bureau is a large set of servers trying to determine how long it takes to do uh, full country reconstructions from the uh, approximately 6 billion tabulations that we used as input to that. Um, we're also continuing to run sensitivity experiments to show how unique the reconstruction is. We know the reconstruction isn't unique, but, just so, but we also know that the block and the voting age variable are always identical in all the reconstructions. It turns out that most of the variables are identical in most of the reconstructions. And the, there's a small amount of variation in the race and ethnicity and a larger amount of variation in the, in the age. And so, uh, so one of the key features of the disclosure protection system for the 2020 census is that it protects the geospatial location. So those block reconstructions are no longer exactly accurate. Um, we will eventually run the experiments that you asked for, but we're not ready to talk about them yet. Thanks. Hey. Blue shirt. Um, this is Yu Xiang Wang from UC Santa Barbara. Um, thanks for the wonderful talk, and, and I really enjoy the part of the talk where you talk about the social choices associated with choosing the accuracy to, and, and privacy trade-off. Um, so, so, so my question is about the privacy model that's running by U.S. censors, and what's the differences between the choices that has been adopted by tech industry? Because uh, in, in the deployment of Google and Apple, uh, they've been working with the local differential privacy model, where um, um, individuals, when they submit their data, they actually perturb their own data to prevent um, privacy leakage even to the data collectors themselves. Can you comment on that model and what's the differences between uh, this and the model that's adopted and endorsed by the Census Bureau? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, that was the subject of my KDD talk last summer, so if you play that video, you can see it. And it was also discussed in the uh, Census Scientific Advisory Committee meeting, the December 2018 one. So that's why I showed you the statistics on how much data are actually collected in a census. Let's call it 100 gigabytes, less than one second's traffic in this mobile network. The local DP model, the closest approximation to it that we could implement would be with the privacy protections protected, applied at the block level, the lowest level of geography that we get. Or in principle, we could apply them at the address level. It would give the same result. If you build all the tabular summaries using that privacy protection system, they do not have the property 
that as the population in the geographic area increases, the accuracy of the statistic increases. Now, that's a critical failing of that way of doing the privacy protection because we can't wait three decades to get another billion observations if we don't have enough observations to do the redistricting on April 1st of 2021. So a central model is the only viable one. And in a central model, you have to manage the application of the privacy loss budget to all of the table sets. I showed you the hierarchical management for geography. We're doing similar things on other dimensions of the table, but we're not ready to talk about them in public yet. That's why we didn't use the local DP model. Thank you. I think, there, I think you are next. I might be wrong. Oh, OK, go ahead. Sure it's work. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, hello. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm Karl Johan Simon Gabriel from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Germany. I'm not an expert, so please forgive my ignorance if this, stupid is, if this question is stupid. But I was wondering, um, is the reconstruction probability um, homogeneous across the population? Because I could imagine, for example, that for some parts of the population, reconstruction would work very well, and for others not. I don't know, for example, if you live in Alaska, it's more easy to identify you than if you live in Los Angeles. Thank you for that question. Uh, by agreement with our own Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, we have so far only released the high-level summaries from that reconstruction attack. But I can tell you that we are preparing a scientific paper. It will, it will be exposed to full peer review. There aren't any good predictors of when the reconstruction attack would be successful. And in particular, the block population, which you might have thought would be a predictor, does not appear to be. We haven't finished the analysis, but does not appear to be a good predictor. Nor does the homophily index for the block, namely how homogeneous are the people in that block on certain characteristics. So at the moment, it does appear that whether that attack is successful is relatively random as a function of characteristics in the population. That's all I can talk about at this point on the, on the specifics of those statistics. Thanks. Hi, Ethan Dyer, Google. Um, sort of a related question. So I was curious if you guys think about redesigning blocks uh, with privacy in mind, is that something that's possible? So yes, that is something that's possible. Thank you for that question. That is something that's possible. I didn't go deeply into the uh, politics under uh, politics in the right word, the regulatory environment underlying the block definitions. But uh, the publication of the redistricting data is the only statutorily mandated product from a census, and the geography at which it is published is subject to negotiation between the Census Bureau and the National Conference for State Legislatures. And that nego those negotiations take place over the course of the decade. And they're confirmed in Federal Register notices uh, that specify first the, the general substance and then the specific form of the, those products. So at this point in the decade, they can't be redesigned. But that's a really reasonable uh, um, looking forward. A recommendation. Thank you. Um, thanks, John. Uh, another question from Yu Xiang Wang from UC Santa Barbara. Um, so, um, so the question is regarding uh, designing a good accuracy measure that uh, covers every individual in the population. For instance, if in differential privacy introduces uh, error, and does that error hurt the Cal state of California and the state of Iowa in the same way? Uh, and what's the implication of the different uh, accuracy metric in the, cho in the social choices? So I've only shown you, thank you for that question. I've only shown you accuracy measures that we developed uh, for redistricting data. We are currently working with the voting rights section at the Department of Justice and with the demographers to develop other accuracy measures. Um, the, the question is whether they are fit for use, and the fitness for use means that you have uh, some idea that they perform properly 
in some hopefully very large percentage of the applications. We use a, a fitness for use measure on the American Community Survey one year tabulations that says if the table doesn't have a median coefficient of variation less than 0.61, the whole table is suppressed. And that has nothing to do with privacy protection. It has to do with accuracy. We don't consider those data fit for use. So we're trying to develop metrics like that and then with metrics like that, you can assess whether there are some parts of the country that wouldn't get as much data. And that would, of course, be a concern that would have to be addressed. Thanks uh, again. How, how I, about the, um, there's how a, about the... There's a bunch of other people who want to ask some questions. Okay. I thought I'd give them a chance, OK? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chris with the uh, Department of Defense. I'm curious how the reconstruction uh, probabilities um, and accuracies that you get uh, compared to what you might get with publicly available um, demographic data, uh, say, the, the simplest example would be uh, guessing everybody is Caucasian. Uh, we haven't, thank you for that question. We haven't completed those experiments yet. That is something that our internal reviewers have asked to see. So I don't have a good answer. That's a reasonable question. Um, hello, my name is Doron from the Technion in Israel. Um, I would imagine that some features are more, um, I would be concerned from some features to be more private than others. Do you uh, take that into account when you define your differential privacy? So by statute, all features are equally sensitive in statistical agency publications. And so we are, um, that's one of the few statutory prohibitions. Okay. Fitness for use, on the other hand, says that the accuracy uh, doesn't have a comparable requirement. So uh, we are considering the use cases for the different tables separately. Hope that helps. Okay, thank you. I think you. That, that had to be the last question, right? Okay. All right, so thank you all very much. I really enjoyed this.